Within the construction industry, there's a group of engineers and designers known as MEP engineers, mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. And in this video, we are going to explore exactly what the E and MEP does, the electrical engineers. If you're new to my channel, welcome. My name is Rob. I am a licensed professional electrical engineer, having practiced in the MEP electrical industry for over 35 years. My videos typically cover how to use Revit for electrical design of buildings, but I also cover many other topics related to MEP electrical engineering. So speaking of electrical engineering, it is a huge field that varies from everything from tiny microchip design to electronics, robotics, building electrical systems like power and control, as well as generation of electrical power through power plants or solar or wind and wave and transmission and distribution of those huge amounts of power. It can deal with communication systems like digital signal processing, radio frequency engineering, microwave engineering. So how do we define what the MEP electrical engineers do? Well, simply put, we can be called the architects of the electrical systems within buildings. We typically work on buildings or at least facilities. You could say that we are kind of a branch of power electrical engineers. MEP engineers are also typically called consulting engineers. We are typically part of a large team of engineers and architects. So we have architects, interior designers, structural engineers, civil engineers, mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineers, fire protection engineers, technology engineers. So a whole team of professionals working together to design these buildings. We design all kinds of buildings, everything from just a small restroom facility at maybe a local park to big retail buildings or buildings with tenant spaces, school buildings, hospitals, multifamily housing like apartments, both two and three story all the way up to things like 30 story skyscraper buildings, hotels, other hospitality things like restaurants, sports stadiums, truck manufacturing plants, FedEx, UPS, Amazon distribution facilities, office buildings, even parking garages or amusement parks. There's a wide range of buildings or facilities that we get involved with. We don't build the building. That is what the electricians do. However, we design the building. We draw the blueprints. We specify the actual products that the electricians will use to build more advanced buildings. Yes, many electricians design as well. And often we are teamed up with electricians to design buildings together. We use the engineer's technical background along with the electrician's real world street construction knowledge. Those blend together to form a very efficient design team. We don't design the chips or the electronics. We don't design robots. We don't code them, but we do make sure that the power can get to these devices in a safe and reliable manner. Also, we don't design the dams or the wind turbines or solar panels or coal or nuclear plants that generate the electrical power, nor the big transmission lines that run across the country. However, we do intercept that power and safely distribute it throughout the building. We are not dealing with discrete components like resistors, capacitors, inductors, transistors. But we do have to deal with the properties of resistance, impedance, capacitance, inductance of the equipment that we do interconnect, such as wiring, circuit breakers, fuses, the generators, motors, power factor correction capacitors, and transformers. We need to understand a variety of topics like the basics of circuits, parallel and series circuits, how generators work, how motors work, how transformers work, three-phase and single-phase power, and even things like how three-way switches work for lighting or four-way switches for line voltage control. We need to know volts, amps, watts, power factor, volt amps. We need to understand how circuit breakers work, both the temperature and magnetic portion, how fuses work, how to do short circuit calculations or fault currents and even advanced things like arc flash studies. We are proficient in many kinds of apps, like Word or Google Docs, uh, spreadsheets, AutoCAD, 
and Revit for drafting and designing, as well as Navisworks or Dynamo for more advanced features. You need to know things like Bluebeam, short circuit and arc flash calculation programs like Easy Power or SKM, of course, online meeting apps like Zoom or Teams, or even construction process tracking apps like Procore or eBuilder. And if you're into the lighting design, then you look at lighting simulation software like Visual or AGI. Now, some of us are more into commercial or institutional or hospitality work, and we work closely with architects and interior designers who are tasked with making the buildings look beautiful and work efficiently. So what equipment we use and where we put it are very important. We have to make sure some of our stuff is hidden away in the walls, in ceilings, under the floors, in the back of house areas. And then others of us are more into industrial design. So we get very concerned with things like motor controls, with PLCs and human machine interfaces, and things like variable frequency drives and motor contactors and other forms of control systems. We need to be very knowledgeable about the electrical equipment that does go into a building, like conduit and other types of raceways, they're called, types of wiring, aluminum, copper, types of insulation. THHN, THWN, etc. And need to know about how those things are actually mounted onto things like Kindorf or Unistrut channels. Using all thread rods and nuts and washers to hang these things. Metal and non-metallic outlet boxes and junction boxes, pull boxes. Panel boards with circuit breakers in them. Switch boards with big fuses and circuit breakers. Transformers to step up and step down the voltage or isolate the power. Receptacles, plug things in. Switches, both line voltage or even electronic digital switches for controlling lighting and other loads. Occupancy sensors, daylight sensors, safety disconnect switches, labeling of equipment, uninterruptible power supplies, also called UPS, which is a battery backup for data centers, even nowadays for things like backing up your elevator or your emergency lighting. Lighting fixtures, relays, EV charge points solar power connections and inverters, etc., etc. Now, if you're getting some value out of this video, I'd sure appreciate if you hit that thumbs up like button down below to help promote it to other viewers who may find it informational as well. And also, if you want to see much more content about MEP electrical engineering, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. Sure appreciate it. Back to the video. We design all kinds of typically alternating current systems with different characteristics. Everything from a 120 240 volt split phase system in an American house or a 208Y 120 volt three phase four wire system in a commercial building, perhaps a 480 volt Y 277 volt three phase four wire system in a large commercial building or industrial building, and even have to sometimes deal with older systems like a 12243 phase four wire delta system with split phase, or even a 480 volt three phase three wire corner grounded delta. So there's a wide variety of electrical systems we have to be familiar with. Sometimes we will do evaluations of existing buildings to determine their suitability for their intended purpose. Are the electrical systems old and outdated? Are they antiquated? Are replacement parts still available? Are things sized appropriately? Are they in bad repair or damaged? Are they still code-worthy? Do they meet current codes? Sometimes we will help a potential buyer determine whether they want to buy that building or maybe help a school district decide what they need to include in their next bond measure to improve the quality of their buildings. We have to become knowledgeable about codes like the NEC, which is the National Electrical Code. But not only that, we also have to know about other true building codes, fire codes, elevator codes, mechanical codes, and energy codes, including state ordinances. We need to be familiar with UL listings and product and installation standards like NECA or NEMA. Some of us get into the niche of technology design like telephone data with you know, CAT5, CAT6, fiber, racks and patch panels, can get into security systems, CCTV camera systems, intercom systems, even fire alarm systems. So what are some of the traits that you should have to be in this MEP electrical field? 
Well, like it's kind of standard for most engineering fields in that you need to be a natural problem solver and you need to have a desire for problem solving. Everything you do can be boiled down to solving problems. How do I design a building electrical system? How do I fit it in there? How do I get enough power where I need it? How do I make it look great? All these are problems that we solve every day. So you have to enjoy that. You also need to be inherently curious about how things work. And with electrical, need to be able to visualize some abstract concept of things you can't actually see. We can't see electrons flowing through a conductor. We can't see electromagnetic waves propagating throughout space. So having that ability to conceptualize those things is very useful. So you may wonder what kind of math we use in the MEP electrical field. Typically on a day-to-day -day basis, we need to be familiar with just uh, basic algebra, but also geometry and trig are very helpful in spatial planning as well as dealing with things like, you know, sine waves. We don't have any calculus in our day-to-day -day work. We let our apps do that for us, for example, with short circuit calculations. It's good to have the theory of those things in your head so that you can realize what is actually going on. The most typical use for high-level math would be if we were trying to understand some technical paper, for example, maybe about how an inverter works or solving some very technical issues like high harmonic levels in your power, dirty power, things like that. Our work is typically office work, so you have to not mind sitting in front of a computer most days. We're typically working in CAD or Revit or we're doing, using spreadsheets, using Bluebeam, doing code research or product research, reviewing existing information like blueprints or shop drawings or what we call submittals of actual equipment, reviewing service records and test reports. However, we do occasionally have some outside work. We go on what we call a site visit to visit an existing facility that maybe we're going to remodel or add on to. We need to see what is there now. What is the existing electrical system that we either need to add on to or replace or upgrade? Now and then we will visit buildings that are actually under construction to verify it is being constructed, meeting the standards that was set, and making sure that the owner of that building is getting what they paid for. We have a lot of meetings. Again, we're part of a team, so we have meetings with these architects and the other engineers. We have meetings with building owners or operators. We have meetings with the contractors that are actually going to build this project. And we have meetings with equipment manufacturers or sales representatives to learn how their products work. Now there's professional engineers such as myself, but there's also technician jobs. You don't have to be licensed to do work in this field as long as you work under a licensed professional. Now to get this license it depends upon the state but it typically involves a four-year degree in engineering and passing the Fundamentals of Engineering Exam, the FE it's called, and you become an engineer in training or an EIT. And then furthermore, you need at least four years of experience working under a professional engineer doing engineering type of work and then passing your PE, Professional Engineers Exam. Then you will become a licensed PE and allowed to practice engineering in your field in that state. Now, one big component of that also is taking your ethics exam. One of the primary responsibilities of professional engineers is protecting the public. When we stamp and sign our project, we are certifying that it has been designed directly under our supervision, and we are responsible that it is a safe place for the public. So we don't take that responsibility lightly. So I hope you enjoyed this overview of MEP Electrical Engineering. And if you did, take a look at this video I have linked up above about what exactly is a one-line diagram that we use in our MEP Engineering. Until next time, thanks for watching.